Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Pete LePage, and I'm a developer advocate on the Chrome team. And today, we're going to be talking more about using great tools for building mobile web applications. Last week, uh, some of you may have joined me for a special uh, Chrome Developer Tools session, mobile developer tools session, where we talked about some of the really neat tools that you can use, right. like libraries and other stuff like that. This week, we're going to talk about testing and emulation and other great tools that you'll find will help you to build great mobile applications. So, like I said, welcome. Um, so last week, uh, the link to the slides is there. There's the development environment stuff that we talked about, the authoring framework stuff, as well as some of the libraries. This week, it's the testing and iteration flow and some performance tooling. If you're looking for some other great tools, uh, Paul Irish has a great session on the tooling and uh, web app development stack that you can uh, check out. And these slides will be available after the fact as well. If you want to go and uh, follow along or ask questions as we're going, the link is there at the bottom right here. Uh, well, I guess it does, it's not quite highlighting for me right now. But you can see the link at the very bottom if you have questions, you want to post those. Feel free to go uh, post your questions as we move along. And I'll take your questions uh, as we go and at the end of the session. So let's jump in and talk about some testing tools and ways that you can better test and see how your environment works when you're building mobile web applications. So one of the first things I want to talk about is the network link conditioners and really sort of understanding how you can better understand and better test the experiences that you're getting when your users are, are experiencing their websites on a mobile device, right? Because on a mobile device, you can't always count on having a, a 3G connection. Sometimes it may be edge. Sometimes it may be Wi-Fi. Sometimes that Wi-Fi may be worse than a 3G connection. Sometimes it may be really spotty. Sometimes it may not exist at all. So there are some great tools that are available for testing on your mobile device. Uh, there's two that I think are really uh, interesting. Charles Proxy, which is available there. It's available for the PC, for the Mac, and for Linux. So you can install it on whatever platform you're using. Um, and it will go in and uh, basically proxy all the, the network connections. So all the requests that are going through, go through that proxy. And you can specify how you want it to behave. The other one that's pretty interesting is the network link conditioner. And this is a Mac tool. This is something that you need to get uh, through the Apple developer tools. So when you install Xcode, you can get it there. And the network link conditioner in, is installed in your uh, system settings. Let me, uh, let me bring it up here. Uh, so I'll bring up my tools, my system preferences. And uh, down here at the bottom, you can see this network link conditioner. So when I start the network link conditioner, I have a couple of options that I can choose from. I can choose the profile and whether I want to turn it on or off. So first off, let's go in and turn it on. But let's turn it on for uh, an edge good uh, connectivity. So if I do this, you can see a couple of things get set by default. It limits the bandwidth that my device can connect to the network with. So I no longer have the full network bandwidth available. I only have a 256K byte uh, kilobit uh, stream. I also, uh, I'm not going to drop any packets, but it's going to add a 350 second millisecond delay to all of my requests on the downlink. On the uplink, it's going to put in a 200K connection speed uh, and a delay of about three, 370 milliseconds. So by turning that stuff on, it's going to slow your network connection down. It's going to cause some, some pretty slow things. So I'm going to bring up my website, because I know my website is uh, n probably not exactly designed for uh, slow connections, so petelepage.com. And uh, you'll notice like it takes a little while for stuff to come in. And it takes that extra time. So basically, what it's doing is pruning down my network. It's, it's, it's making my pipe smaller, so to speak. Um, so that way, you can s get a better idea of how your network is going to behave under low bandwidth connections. It's a really good way of testing and understanding. 
Through here, you can also go in and you can set things like, hey, I want to see uh, what a lossy network is going to look like. So notice here we've got 1% packet dropped and a 440 millisecond delay. Uh, and I guess it really helps to turn this guy on. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this on. Uh, I have to enter in my password. So turn my password on. So now, oh, let's just make sure I got turned on here. On. So now, PeteLePage.com. I guess I didn't get it on earlier. So now let's see how long this takes to load. Again, much slower, right? So before we saw it load reasonably fast. Now we're still waiting for content to come down. We don't have that section on the right. So I can see that the important content on my personal website comes up pretty quickly. The, the thing that I want people to be able to see here on the uh, thinking about comes up pretty quick. Uh, but the other content is going to take a while to load. When the network conditioner is running, you've got this little guy up here telling you, hey, it's up and running. And so you can bring it up really easily if you want to change it. If you want to go back and say, hey, I'm on uh, uh, 3G or, or whatever, you can turn that on and off pretty quickly, really easily, without having to go fight through lots of stuff. So good tool to be able to use and understand. Charles Proxy is uh, really powerful as well. Uh, Charles Proxy, one of the great things about it is it'll do all of your network connections. And it gives you a lot more inspection ability. So you can go in and see what's going on with particular requests. You could take one specific request and make it take forever. So you drop one specific request if you're doing a lot of XHR requests or something to that effect. So a good way to be able to specify uh, some of those things in there. On Android, if you want to do this on a, on a phone or on a tablet, you can do it on a phone or tablet as well. Um, on Android, you can set up the proxy to go through a particular device. So you, it's kind of buried in there. Uh, I'll get a blog post out or something up on the Chrome developers page in the next day or so to talk about that. But you can go in and you can turn that proxy on so that you can actually use that. Under iOS uh, 5, uh, sorry, under iOS 6, if you have the developer tools turned on, you can turn on the network link conditioner in there as well so that you can uh, see how the network conditioner works on that particular device so you can test it again in a specific scenario to understand how things are going to work, how they're going to behave. So let's go ahead and close that and uh, go back to our slides here. Um, so faking it with the network link conditioner is just one way that you can understand how your app is going to work if uh, your, how your app is going to work for your users who may not be connecting with the same great bandwidth that you're connecting with. One of the next things I want to talk about is some of the, the developer tools within Chrome, because Chrome offers a lot of great tools to help you test your web application. Uh, and you know, I, I call it faking it because it provides an emulation experience. It's not going to be a true experience because you're not running on the same hardware. The the uh, processor in my on my Chrome OS machine or on my Mac or anything like that is obviously much faster than it is on my phone or tablet. But at least I can be able to go in, understand what's going on, and I can get a pretty good sense of how these things are working. So there's a couple of things that you can do in the Chrome Developer Tools. Uh, so I'm going to bring up the Chrome Developer Tools now so that we can see what's going on here. So I've got the Developer Tools up. And uh, I'm going to go click on this little guy here in the bottom, the uh, little gears icon for the settings. When I bring up the settings, if I go to Overrides, I can change a number of uh, Chrome settings. So first off, I can change my user agent so I can fake out to the browser. Uh, or to my server, what uh, application or what browser I'm running as. So I could say, hey, you know, I'm running as an uh, uh, iPhone iOS 4. And so sure enough, it shows here what my user agent is. You can see it showing up there. But it also automatically turns on the device metrics. Now, this is one of those things that I think is really powerful and really, really useful to web developers. Because what it does is it sets the screen resolution to the same screen resolution that I would get. Uh, if I was on that device. So in this particular case, it's got 640 by, 48, uh, by 960. So it's setting my screen resolution to the right size. Uh, it turns on a font scale factor, so whether it's going to scale my fonts or not. 
So you've got the device metric. So you can see what your uh, experience is going to look like. Much easier to do this than it is to resize your browser, right? Like you can, I'm sure everybody's done it here before where you try and resize your browser down to exactly the right size and getting it to that particular size you want is just, it's a pain in the butt. So this is a good way to be able to go in and say, hey, I need a particular screen size. So sure enough, there's the, the screen size. You can see these things are, are rendering as I expected. Um, one of the next things that you can do is overriding the uh, geolocation position. So you can fake out to the browser where you are. If you want to say, hey, look, I'm in New York, or I'm in Mountain View, or I want to go test something, you can go in and you can specify the latitude here and the longitude here. So that you can say, hey, this is where I am right now. I want you to just pretend, take my word for it that this is where I am, in case you're doing any kind of geolocation uh, testing. And you can also say, in particular, I want to emulate a, a particular position. So I want to say, or emulate the uh, position unavailable, which may happen maybe if you're in a nice cement room where you can't get a location, or maybe you just the user chooses not to provide a device location. So going in and being able to specify exactly the, the location or whether the location is not available, another one. You can go in and you can also do device orientation. So how the device is with the alpha, beta, and gamma uh, channel. And there's a great article up on HTML5 Rocks if you want to understand how those guys work. Um, one thing to keep in mind when you think about that is it's all of the alpha, beta, gamma is how you would normally hold the device. So in some cases, you know, I'd hold my device like this, but on a different device, you might hold it like this or like this. So both of those are all things that you need to take into account for the device orientation and device lo uh, motion stuff. Finally, on here, you can see the, the emulate touch events. So that's going to uh, simulate touch events and fire the touch events at the same when I click on things. Uh, so those are all available. I think uh, device orientation is available in beta. It's not available in the stable channel yet. So if you need to go in and check, you want to try one of those, go have a quick peek in the uh, device in the beta or even in the dev or canary or even the chromium channel. Uh, there's a couple of new ones that are coming soon. Let me uh, pull up uh, uh, chromium for a sec, because I think this one's kind of neat. Uh, so I'll bring up chromium here. And I'll just go to google.com, bring up the developer tools. Again, same thing. Go click on the, the little guy here. And under overrides, I now also have emulate CSS media um, so that I can go in and say, hey, you know, in this particular case, I want you to pretend that I am a print device. And I want you to show me what the, what the page is going to look like if you're applying the print style. Right? Rather than having to go hit print every single time to see what it looks like and look in the print preview, you can just go apply that print style. Maybe you want to go uh, uh, use a different one like uh, screen or projection or something like that. You can go see how, the, how all of those look. So easy way to go do this. And if you're ever curious about uh, what you, uh, what's coming and um, what's down the pipe, uh, always check out Chromium. My general recommendation, if you're sort of looking to stay on the edge, but you want something pretty stable and you want to be able to test some of the newer features, is to install Chrome Beta or Chrome Stable as your primary uh, browser experience. And then install either Chrome Canary or Chromium, uh, Chromium itself. And that way, you'll always have the latest. You'll always have the greatest. You can see what's going on in the, in the fun new stuff. And you can see what's going on in the stable regular thing, how most of your users are going to see things. I personally like to go with beta, so that way I'm a little bit ahead of the curve. And if the bug gets introduced on something or maybe something changes, I'm going to see it before my users are. And that, to me, is really important. I want to know about these things before my users do, because I want to make sure that I've got a great experience. So uh, a bunch of great Chrome dev tools. There's a bunch of great sessions available on uh, Google Developer Live that go into much more depth on how to use some of these uh, dev tools. I just sort of wanted to give you a good introduction to, to a couple of these things. So uh, let's move on to the, the next one. 
and talk about some of the emulators. Emulators are a great way to get an idea how things might work. Is it going to behave how you expect it to behave in the, the native environment? Now, again, you're not going to get the exact performance characteristics, and there are some things that may or may not work in the emulator. For example, the camera doesn't work in the emulator uh, for most of these devices, but it does work in other places. So you're pretty good. Uh, or it does work on the device, but most other things work. So there's a few places where you, this is a good way to go and, and do this. So there's a couple of good emulators available. There's the Android emulator, which I've got linked there. It's a quick, easy thing to install. Uh, it's not exactly the fastest thing, but it's pretty decent. And it does give a fair representation. Uh, if you install Xcode, uh, you can go and get the iOS simulators, which will give you the uh, iPhone an iPad, the iPhone 5, the iPhone 4. In fact, it'll give you quite a few. Let me uh, bring up uh, one of the iOS simulators. So, so when I bring up the iOS simulator, sure enough, here we go. We've got uh, Safari running right now. Let me make this a little bit smaller so that it's nice and small. Here we go. Uh, so you can see that I've got Safari on here. I can start Safari. Uh, it starts up pretty quick. Uh, if I go type in here, I can go click on this and type html5rocks.com. It just uses my network connection to go pull this stuff down. Shows me exactly as I would expect things to be. So in this particular case, and it also responds to touch events. So in order to scroll, what I have to do is go click on the, uh, the page and then scroll up. So I've got that sort of real experience as I'd expect it to behave on a true device. Uh, in the If I go back up to the top and I want to go search here, I can click on in here. And I can, if I wanted to type, so I said device orientation, uh, V, I, you know, you can see this would take me forever. Device, V, I, orientation. So sure enough, I go click on that, I should get some some results here, and sure enough, here's that device orientation article that I was talking about earlier. So we can go through, scroll, and, and see all the stuff that we're looking for. So there's a good, easy way to be able to go in and test this. You can switch between different hardware, so you can change from the iPad to the iPad Retina to an iPhone, whatever, you, whatever you're looking to test. That same is true for uh, Android as well. You can try different devices. You can try different characteristics on those devices, whether they have a keyboard, whether they don't have a hardware keyboard. So quick, easy way to be able to go and, and do these guys. So let's go back to our slides here and uh, continue on from here. The other one that's worth checking out is Browser Stack. Browser Stack's a great tool that you give it a link to your site, and it'll go render it. In, several different browsers and give you the screenshots. And in fact, uh, I believe on this one, it even gives you access to the DOM, which is pretty slick because you can go in and you can try seeing how things behave in, in the DOM. But you know, emulators are only so good, right? We want to be able to test these on real devices, understand how these are going to behave in a real scenario. So Let's have a look at how you'd use one of the remote debuggers. And actually, we'll have a look at a couple of the remote debuggers. Uh, you can do uh, remote debugging with Chrome for uh, Android on an Android device. You can do it with uh, Safari on uh, iOS 6 and uh, Safari 6. And you can actually do it on Firefox as well. And I've got all the slides that walk you through the instructions on how to do this. Uh, and you can follow the instructions along uh, on your own. So. For Android, the first thing you got to do is there's on all of these, there's a one-time setup experience. You have to go set a few things up, turn debugging on, that kind of thing. So for Android, we need to install the debugger for uh, the SDK first. Once we've done that, on our mobile device, we need to enable uh, USB debugging at the OS level. If you've got a phone that uh, has not ever gone into uh, developer mode before, you're going to have to go through a uh, clicking, I think it's you click on the about phone settings uh, like seven times, and that brings it up. If you can't find the developer uh, USB developer options in the settings menu, just do a quick search. You'll find it pretty quickly. Um, once you've got that done, uh, we need to open up Chrome, and we need to uh, enable the uh, debugger 
Bleh. Try that again. Enable the web debugger within Chrome. So once you've done all that, the basic stuff. So I've already done all that stuff on my device. Let me uh, bring up a device down here. So I've got my device, uh, and I'm going to uh, unlock it here. So, and let's bring up Chrome. And so uh, we'll go to HTML5 rocks. Uh, I'm just going to grab my phone. So HTML5 rocks. And this will take a second and uh, load. Let me zoom this in just a little bit so you can see this a little bit better. All right, so now that we've got this, uh, there's a couple of things that we need to do. On our desktop, uh, I'm going to come out, and we need to run uh, ADB forward. Um, now, I have this set up as a script, so I'll just show you what my script says. Uh, so you can see here, I, it's ADB forward. TCP 9222, uh, and then local abstract. I recommend just having a little script to do this, because it's a heck of a lot easier than it is to go and, and remember that all the time. Um, but what this does is it connects through my uh, USB port to my device and allows me to do remote debugging. So I'll do clank debug. It's gone and run. So now, when we go back to Chrome, let's go open a new tab. And we'll go to localhost colon 9222. So at this point, we get two windows that pop up. So we've got the Mobile Web Developer Toolkit and the HTML5 rocks. So when I click on this, it opens up the dev tools, just like I'm used to seeing on my uh, computer. But this is now showing everything on the mobile device. Now, I've got like the standard resources, so I can go see all the files that have been pulled down. I can go and uh, if we reload this page, so let me go hit reload here, um, you can see all of the network requests coming in. So we can see how everything's going. We can see all the scripts that got pulled down. So if I go and click and say, OK, well, let's see what this script looks like. OK, lots of great stuff in here. Uh, the timeline to understand what's going on. Again, all the stuff that you're used to being able to use and see within the Chrome developer tools are all available here for you right now. So in particular, what I want to go do is show you a couple of things uh, in here, because it behaves just like it does on your, uh, on your desktop. I can go in, and sure enough, notice how in the actual device, as I highlight through different portions, if I go and expand my header, OK, great. So there's that hyperlink there. I can go through, and you know, I want to actually go and let's find the where the main content is here. All right, so I think my main content is where are we going here? Content. I know I there. There we go. I think that's our content. Okay, so div. All right, so I'm going to expand this out, and uh, so there's that. So now. We can start going through and finding all of the different pieces that we want. Uh, and we can go through and change these things. So I'm having a hard time finding this. I always love going for these kinds of things. Live sessions. Let's go up to nav, unordered list, expand this. And instead of it saying home, uh, let's say Pete was here. Woohoo! Right? And sure enough, if we go have a look at our page, uh, well, we're replacing those with images, so of course it's not going to show that particular right now. But uh, let me try. Let me see if I can get a different one. I'm pretty sure it won't work, but Pete was here. Yeah, there we go. All right, so we've got Pete was here. Um, so you can go through. You can change all the things that you'd expect to normally be able to change within the Chrome Developer Tools. Nice, easy way to be able to go in, understand what's going on and build your website, your web application without too many things. You can apply styles. Now, the one thing to keep in mind, this is being served from the developer tools on the device. So you are getting the device developer tools. So currently, this is Chrome, uh, Chrome that's available in the marketplace is Chrome 18. So you're only going to have the standard Chrome 18 features. Uh, so if I go down here and I bring up uh, my settings, I don't have the ability to be able to change my UA string. I don't have the, uh, actually, yes, I do have the ability to change my user agent. 
uh, but I don't have the ability to be able to go and change my device metrics or anything like that. Now, obviously, it would be a little weird to change the device metrics on something that's already a little tiny. But you know, one of those things you may or may not want to do at some point in the future. Certainly, a uh, uh, setting geolocation is something that's interesting and, and that you might want to be able to do. So with that, uh, let's, uh, let's get out of here. So that's the Chrome debugging, uh, remote debugging. Gives you easy access to be able to go through uh, and debug Chrome remotely. Let's take a look at how you do uh, Safari on iOS 6 and, and on the iPad. So again, very similar. There's a, an initial set of uh, setup that you're going to need to go through. And I'm going to just switch out some devices here so that I can plug an iPad in and we can get this connected. Now, uh, uh, again, one of the key things that you need to be aware of is that it does that same thing where it needs to be connected directly to your device. So you need to plug in via USB uh, and your device is connected. So now, um, let me bring up our device so we can see what's going on here. So here we go. We've got we've got my uh, device, and the setup uh, settings are pretty much the same. Uh, we need to go through and uh, in Safari uh, on our iPad or on our iPhone, we need to enable the uh, advanced and uh, settings so that we can go in and, and actually see what's going on. Uh, but we also need to, on our computer, go and turn those things on as well so that we've got, uh, got them set up there as well. So sure enough, uh, I've got my iPad up and working here. So you can see that we've got everything running. Um, and so now, very similarly, we're going to do the same thing. So uh, I'll start up Safari. Uh, and we'll come out of the slides. And Safari. Great, so Safari comes up just as we would normally expect. Uh, I'll make this full screen so that we can see everything going on. There we go. And what I'm going to do is go to the Develop menu. And you'll notice that your device shows up in the Develop menu. So I go and click uh, Pete's iPad, and it shows me all of the tabs that are currently open. So I can go and click on HTML5 Rocks. And sure enough, there it goes. We've got my page up, open, and ready for me to start debugging. Now, these are the Safari developer tools. So I've, uh, if you're used to using those, you've got the ability to be able to do all of the things that you'd expect to be able to do. And notice as you start going through these things, you get that same experience, right? So uh, let me uh, just bring this down so that we can see this a little bit better. Uh, and I'm going to zoom in just a little bit more so that we can uh, see this. So again, same thing. I'll open up the header, open up my nav. And uh, again, here's my unordered list. And uh, post some tutorials. I'll change this. Pete was here. And uh, sure enough, can we see that there? There you go. So it says Pete was here. So you've got that same set of tools, same set of abilities to be able to go in and do remote debugging as you'd expect to be able to do. So this is a really great way to understand what's going on with the experience. How are things working? Are Is something going a little bit weird? Is something maybe not acting like it, you'd expect it to? Is it pulling down different data? Uh, on the uh, on this device as well, you do have the ability to be able to get in and turn on the network link connect, uh, conditioner. Let me uh, see if I can find that real quick and, and show you guys. Uh, but it's under settings. And uh, under the developer tools, uh, see if I can find this here real quick. Um, uh, I'm. Of course, I'm not going to be able to find it. Well, I uh, I didn't plan on showing this. I th was thinking about it after the fact and thought it might be kind of cool to show. Uh, but I don't see it, so I won't show it today. Uh, it is a way that you can go in, be able to go and set the things that you want. Uh, yeah, OK. All right, well, you can trust me that it, it is in here somewhere. 
a uh, quick, easy way to be able to go in, set up the network settings, uh, and turn on the, the particular things that you, you might be looking to do. So Firefox has the same uh, setup, or, or similar setup. One of the key differences on the Firefox setup that uh, I really appreciate in their particular setup is that you don't necessarily need to uh, connect the device via USB. You can actually do it over the network. So as long as both devices are connected to the same uh, network and on the same subnet, you can connect in. Again, there's a bunch of setup that you need to go to. On the desktop, you're going to need to enable remote debugging. And on the uh, remote device, on, on your mobile, either your phone, your tablet, whatever you need to do, you need to go and uh, turn on the, the debugger. You need to turn on the uh, local debugger, uh, set that to false so that it sends all the, the connection out. Uh, in fact, let's see if we've got it set up. Uh, actually, I'm. I tried it earlier today. It didn't work. I don't want to go and, and try it again. Uh, I think it, the reason it didn't work is uh, I just didn't have the same subnet set up, or there's some kind of firewall rules within, within our subnet that prevents that from happening. Uh, again, you can go check out the link there where you can see the uh, how to get more instructions on getting that set up. But it's a pretty easy way to be able to go through and, and see how your experience is going to work. Uh, one of the other really important ways that you can test your devices, and this is something that is, I think, super important, and I, I really want to encourage the community to go out and participate and help in, with these open device labs. But the concept behind an open device lab is to have a space where anybody can come in, test their web application on the variety of devices that are out there, right? When you think about the cost of maintaining multiple devices between all the different versions, the different uh, operating systems, the different size screens, the different pro uh, processors, all of a sudden that becomes a pretty complex and almost nightmarish experience to do. And so to be able to go through and use something like an open device lab where there's just tons of devices available, and not just the latest and greatest devices, but also older devices that have been around for a little while, or uh, devices that are maybe new but have newer but have the original uh, version of their operating system on them. Uh, so having those open device labs are, uh, are a really fantastic thing. If you have uh, spare devices you're not using anymore, donate them to your local device lab. Uh, but if you've, uh, or if you're in an area where there's not an open device lab, start one. Find some folks, find a location where you can help start your own open device labs. There's a great blog post uh, and uh, here that talks about all of the open device labs, as well as where you can go to uh, find them, as well as how to start your own. Um, there's a couple here. Uh, there's one that's just starting in Brooklyn. We're trying to get one started in, in Manhattan. There's uh, one in San Francisco, I believe, is on its uh, is getting started. Uh, there's one in Oakland. We need these all over the place. We need these all around the world so that developers have a place where they can go and test their applications, where you can go, where I can go, because I don't have every device, and I'm sure you don't either, and you probably don't want to maintain all those devices either. Right, crazy, crazy amounts of work to, to go do that. So with that, I've got a couple of favors uh, to ask before I start taking some of your questions. Uh, I will uh, just bring up uh, a slide so that you can uh, have a look. If you've got questions, you can post them there to that uh, Google short link, and I'll take your questions uh, here in a minute. But we need your help. We can't accept the status quo with, with web development. It just simply doesn't work anymore, and we need developers to really push the limits of what's cool, of what's available, and just do cool stuff. If you're building something, don't accept that, oh, you know, it's mobile, so it's kind of going to be slow, or it's going to suck. Don't accept that. That's not a good answer. Go build awesome for the web. If you find bugs, if you find things that don't work as you expect them in Chrome for Android, tell us about them. We want to hear about them. You can go file bugs at new.mcrbug.com. 
Also, go there. Have a look to see what bugs are already filed and star the things that you think are important. Do you think it's important that there's an ability to be able to hide the address bar? There's a bug for that. Go star that if you think that's important. Reliable viewport control. There's a bug for that. We've got lots of bugs filed already, and we want your help to make sure that we're making Chrome for Android the best browser that it can be. If you're building cool stuff, tell us about it. When we launched Chrome a number of years ago, one of the things that we did was launch Chrome Experiments, which was sort of this playground for people showing off the cool stuff that they built on the web. Well, when we launched Chrome for Android back in June, we wanted to say to developers, show us the cool stuff you're doing on the mobile web. Show us cool. And it's a great place where you can show the rest of the world all the cool stuff that you're doing with the mobile web. So build some cool mobile experiments that work great on mobile devices that take advantage of the unique capabilities of a mobile device. Maybe touch, maybe device orientation, maybe multi-touch, but works beautifully on that small screen and just is an awesome experience. Show us those things. Show off your skills. Show it off to your friends. Do neat stuff. Start an open device lab in your area. If you haven't started one or you haven't seen one in your area or you think it's important, go do it. We'd love to have more of these. It's really important to get these out, to get, div get access to these devices so that we can build more cool stuff and make sure it works on the plethora of devices that are out there. Um, but really, the mobile web is what you and I make it. We have an opportunity to build absolutely cool. We have the ability to do amazing stuff. And it's up to us as web developers to go do it. So don't accept the status quo. Go build cool. So with that, uh, I'll uh, open it up to your questions. I've seen already uh, one question in, in our moderator. Um, as well as uh, a bunch of other places. These slides are available if you want. Let me uh, get rid of this, uh, this guy here for a sec so that you can see the slides. But the slides are available. Uh, let me, it's always kind of fun to do this because I do this a little backwards. See, it's the, the slide link is right there. Yeah, so the slide link is right there. You can go check out these slides yourself. Uh, as well, you can watch last week's session where we talked about some of the libraries and other, other stuff that we uh, is important for mobile web developers. I'm going to be back uh, in the new year uh, doing more uh, stuff for mobile, talking about high DPI, multi-touch, all sorts of stuff that really is relevant to the mobile web developer. If you're building for the mobile web, you want to tune into these sessions. We'll try and do them uh, at least monthly, if not more, because there's a lot of really great stuff out there. So with that, uh, I'll take uh, your questions. Uh, pop this guy up, and let's just go to me. So you get a nice big picture of me. Uh, so one of the first questions that I've got uh, during my, my session last week, I'm just reading it off the screen here. Uh, during session one, you mentioned to avoid relative and absolute positioning. Why? Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Relative and absolute positioning on a mobile device can be used, but you need to use them with caution because when you start thinking about, I want to move a this uh, div, for example, over 600 pixels whoop, on a mobile device that's maybe only 320 pixels wide, you're going to move it off screen. So as you think about using uh, absolute and relative positioning, you need to be very careful that you're not using pixels, but instead using either percents or uh, there's a new uh, unit that you can use. I don't think it's landed everywhere. I think it's only landed in a couple of places. Uh, but uh, viewport width. So you can actually say 1% of the viewport width, I want to move it over. So you can move a, a, div, a div or element over a specific amount. So as you think about using uh, absolute and relative positioning, what uh, just think you know in terms of the size of the screen that you're working on. So I guess I should have been a little bit more clear last week. It's really about being careful and not moving stuff over that will show up off screen, because it may just show up in the wrong place, may not even show up on the device anymore. Uh, so the next question uh, that we've got is, uh, what's going on with uh, Chrome for Android for 
Oh, sorry, let me. What's going on for Chrome for Android? Are we going to see another release this year? Uh, are we going to get more developer tools like some of the stuff you showed us earlier? So that's a that's a great question. The Eng team is working on trying to uh, get everything, trying to get sort of a feature parity between the the mobile and desktop versions. Get us to the same version on desktop right now. I uh, I think we're running 24 or 25. On mobile, we're we're only at 18. When they started working on Chrome for Android, they had to do some uh, a fork to the code to be able to make some changes and all that. They're they're almost done if they haven't already finished integrating all those changes back to the main Chromium tree. Now that that's done, they're going to be able to go through and and we'll be able to see hopefully more frequent releases soon. I don't have a date for you on when we're going to see the next uh, release. I've got my fingers crossed that we're going to see it really soon. Uh, but I'm not going to hold my breath uh, on the specific date or, or, or tell you a specific date because I'm not really 100% sure. We want to make sure we get this right. We want to make sure that we're giving you the, the right set of tools uh, and the right set of resources that you need. So that looks like that's the end of the questions. I want to say thank you guys so much for joining us uh, or joining me. Uh, it was a great session, I think, today. I hope you learned a lot. Uh, be sure to check out uh, session number one. Uh, so that you can see in, uh, some of the stuff that's going on. Um, my name's Pete LePage, uh, and thanks for joining me. I hope you have a really great holiday, and uh, we'll see you next year.